Great, so, so without further ado, maybe you can start with some self-introduction. We're really interested in your background, where you came from, your past experience. Um, yeah, and then uh, we'll, we'll also, you know, uh, ask Amelie to, to do that again. Sure. Um, nice to meet you all. My name is Hesu Jo. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I am coming from California here. Um, that's Oyster in the back. And um, I've been a therapist for about 10 years, and I've been with BetterHelp for four. BetterHelp is an online counseling uh, platform that we might talk about a little bit later. Um, background introduction. I Sorry, I'm seeing the questions. I think there's going to be slides in a bit. Um, background about me. I specialize in working folks suffering from anxiety and stress, um, family dynamic issues, relationship stuff. Uh, multicultural issues, especially in families that are a mixture of immigrants and Asian Americans, like myself. Um, and I really focus a lot on Asian American mental health and wellness. Um, right now, in my current position, I do see clients, but I also work to empower other clinicians to be successful in bringing their practice to an online platform. Great. Thank you so much, Huzu, and I really look forward to hear your suggestions and comments about, you know, mental health and how to plan a family together. So, Emily, we apologize. I didn't really hear you before. Maybe some other folks have the same issue. So, would you mind to introduce yourself one more time? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Emily Chaffee. I am based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I own a business called Carolina Birth and Wellness. We are a fertility through postpartum doula agency. So really working with clients to support them every step of the way, however that looks. Um, as I myself am a fertility doula, birth doula, and childbirth educator, as well as a massage therapist. So really working with people to use their body and mind and help them become more actively involved in whatever stage of their life they're in. It's really my passion and I love working with maternal health. And I also am a mirror user. Um, I am currently going through secondary infertility uh, treatments and Mira, even though my LH doesn't get quite as high as it should sometimes, it's still been a really useful tool. So I'm gonna be able to speak both on the professional side as well as the client side. So I hope I'm looking forward to talking to you all. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. So for everyone who have joined, I know many of you are Mira users already. Uh, you know, I'm the CEO and the co-founder for Mira. And the reason I found Mira is really trying to help more women women to uh, prepare the family and have better control of our own health. So with Mira, you can track multiple hormones, almost all the important hormones right now with a really small device at home. And we give you quantitative data. That means you're going to get your actual hormone number. So just like what you're doing the blood work in the lab, but without going to the lab. And you can do that every day. And the app will track your pattern, will track your analysis. So you will know if you have a hormone imbalances, or you getting better? Are you ovulating? What is the best time to try or avoid for a baby? Even after pregnancy, do you have a sign of miscarriage? And even, even after, after that, so how close are you to menopause? If your symptoms are getting better or so on. So, you know, we invented this tool because we really want to, you know, I have a passion to help just fellow women just like us. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends, they're having advanced career, advanced education, just push the uh, fertility to a much later ages right now. So I feel like we should have better experience and better control know ourselves. So I saw some questions in the, uh, in the chat and we will address that later. So for the disclaimer, so again, so this webinar is, is completely free. So it's, it's aimed to help everyone here to answer any concerns you have, any questions you have. It's not really to replace the medical advice. So if you, if you have a medical condition, make sure uh, you search for the answer from your doctors. And the webinar will be structured very similarly to previous webinars. So we will be, uh, uh, you know, the Emily and uh, Jose will be doing a presentation you know, with the slides first, and we'll talk about the concepts and how we should deal with mental health during TTC and while, you know, while everyone else is pregnant, what we should be doing. And then uh, meanwhile, feel free to type your questions into the chat. And I will be watching that, and my team member will be watching that, and we will answer all the questions, address all the questions all together at the end of the webinar. 
Okay, so uh, the first the thing before we start the uh, presentation with Hsu is that we want to have a couple questions for you. So you're gonna see some questions on your screen, and uh, those questions are mostly like to you know try, just trying to understand more about you, like your fertility journey, your fertility goal, what's your background. Uh, so our presentation, our discussion can be more tailored towards your needs, so the content will be more helpful to you. So please help us to get the answers here. You should be able to see two questions on the screen right now. So for question one, we have 100% people saying they're trying to get pregnant pretty actively. And for question two, how do you track your fertility hormone level right now? About 56% people use Mira, thank you so much. And about 22 use some other at home test kits as, as well. And 18% people don't use anything. Thank you so much for the answer. Okay, so without further ado, so Hashu, do you want to control your slides? And we'd love to hear your exciting presentation. I know I already said who I am, but again, I'm saying my name, so I'm Hesu. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. It's my honor to get um, invited to speak here. So hopefully you'll be able to get something helpful from what I'm about to talk about here. So I'm talking really about anxiety and stress in a general way which can be applicable to so many different things going on in life, including this period of your life where you are trying to conceive. So first, anxiety, what is it? It is a response to some kind of triggering event. It involves our psyche. It involves our, that's a typo, should say physiology. So it's, it's something about what's happening in our minds, but also in our bodies. Um, looks like some stuff got cut off here, but can I make it go away? No. And is it normal to experience anxiety? Yes, absolutely. It means you are human, um, among a lot of other things that make you human too. So when I talk about response, this anxiety thing, some people will describe it as a feeling or an emotion or something like that. But truly, it is a response that you are giving to some kind of triggering event. So there's somatic responses, which are responses in your body, and the psychological responses, which you feel as an emotion, which you can think about, conceptualize. It's a cognitive thing. But of course, it's I think it's deeply personal. It can even be a spiritual thing, something that is paining you from the inside. So I'm not going to go through and read this entire list here. But if you're looking at this list and you've noticed yourself experiencing some of these things, chances are you've experienced anxiety. Now, I, I called them responses here, but they're also known as symptoms. Um, I'm trying to stay away from that, but I did include this because I'm sure you're all familiar with that language. And really, when we're talking about symptoms, it makes it sound like this thing that's happening is bad, right? Symptoms are connoted with illness and something that we're trying to make go away or something like that. Um, but really these are responses. And like I said, they're normal human responses to stress. Anxiety is a normal human response to a variety of different situations. It, now, if you feel anxious all of the time, or like much of the time, most of the time, you may be suffering from an anxiety disorder, but really experiencing anxiety here and there somewhere in your life is a very normal response to the everyday triggers that really uh, come to us on a daily basis. Um, like a couple of these somatic symptoms, I wanna talk about anxiety in a way um, to get us to think about it differently. So this response that we have, if you start thinking about it as, this is supposed to help me. This can start helping you feel a little bit better instead of feeling bad that you're feeling anxious. So an example, like perspiration, a lot of us get very sweaty when we're in, in anxious. Like, why is this happening? Well, what your body is doing is proactively uh, regulating temperature, right? So when we're anxious, it's because we're responding to some perception of fear um, there's some kind of perceived danger or threat to our safety. And so that's when the anxiety spikes. Perspiration is your body's way to proactively regulate temperature in order to get you to either fight or flight or freeze. I think a lot of us have heard these things before as responses to fear. Um, same thing with like cold hands and feet. What your body is doing is it's rerouting blood to your big muscle groups. You know, your fingers and your toes, these really small fine tuned motor skills are not really needed when you fight off danger or when you need to run away from a threat. 
Um, and so really the blood is being moved into your bigger muscle groups, like your arms and your legs in order to prepare for fighting or fleeing. You don't really need to think about picking up small little things. And that's maybe why you've experienced very cold hands and feet when you're anxious. Um, people report gastrointestinal discomfort. So it's another thing. Um, if you're really anxious, you may have noticed needing to use the restroom. And this is a evolutionary adaptation. You know, you're emptying your tank and you're making yourself more aerodynamic. And so anxiety is something that has developed in order for us to fight off or flee from danger. And so all of these symptoms, if I had a whole hour to myself, I would go through each of these things and talk about why these physiological responses are actually there um, in intention to try to help us, to protect us, to get us away from this thing that is causing us um, some danger. Now, these psychological symptoms that come or responses, um, these are probably familiar feelings too, you know, feeling worried, scared, nervous, irritable, panicked, vigilant. These kinds of things happen um, with the idea that something is happening in our prefrontal cortex to start thinking about planning ahead. I'm feeling something, and that's generally your body's sign and trigger that you also need to prepare in order to keep yourself safe. Um, so that's kind of anxiety in a nutshell. And moving on to stress, um, they're very, very similar. They're very, very related. Like what's the difference between these things? Let's talk about that. So external events lead to stress, whether that's your job, your family, trying to conceive, um, the roof fell in, you gotta get that repaired. Like something's going on at work and you have a tension arising between you and a colleague. These are external events that lead to stress. Now, anxiety, that stuff that we just talked about, anxiety persists even in the absence of a stressor. So even if you can't pinpoint exactly what it is that's bothering you, it could be that you're suffering from anxiety. But like I said, these things are very similar. So stressed out people report super similar responses, irritability, anger, fatigue, muscle pain, digestive troubles, difficulty sleeping, all this to say anxiety and stress both mess us up a lot of the times. Um, so it's really important to learn how to cope with this stuff, manage this stuff so that you can navigate life in a healthy and fulfilling way. So TTC, of course, prolonged external event for some folks. Um, so how much stress is this like being you know, putting put onto your body, onto your mind. And here, this is a, a chart. It's pretty small on my screen, so I don't know how big it is for you, but this is um, how stress can affect the body. And it points to different areas, um, all from your head to your toes about what's going on and how stress impacts the body. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well here, but stress can also impact you in ways to, that results in fertility problems, erectile dysfunction in men, missed periods. So when you're trying to get pregnant and you have missed periods, how stressful is that? How much of an emotional roller coaster is that? So then we start thinking about the chicken or the egg. It's like, is trying to conceive making me stressed out or is my stress making it so difficult to conceive? I think it's a combination of a, many of these things. Um, and the way that stress impacts uh, your body too, you can see on this list, it can all kind of get categorized into these different areas, the central nervous and endocrine system, respiratory and cardiovascular systems, your digestive muscular sexuality and rep reproductive systems and your immune system. A lot of this stuff is so deeply connected and tied to your body's functioning and well-being and health. Um, I won't get into all of these categories right now, but like, your central nervous system, you know, stress triggers different things in your body and brain to respond. Hormones like adrenaline and cortisol are released when you're stressed out. And these things are released to rev up your heartbeat and start sending blood to the areas that need it most. So I kind of started talking about that with anxiety. So when you're stressed out, your heart is going to start pumping blood to your muscles, heart, your other important organs. Um, and when the perceived danger is gone, that's when you notice that you start getting back to normal. You know, your, your heart rate goes down, the blood returns to your hands, you start feeling like you're safe again. Um, how does stress impact our digestive system? You know, like the liver produces extra blood sugar when you're stressed out. Why does it do that? Because to give you an extra boost of energy so that you can fight or flight or flee. Um, and chronic stress can actually lead to extra glucose sugars, which isn't uh, increases risk of type two diabetes. So as you can see, stress is very powerful. 
and finally this reproductive system. You know, there's a lot of studies that show in men, prolonged stress can lead to drops in testosterone levels, which has an impact on sperm production, erectile dysfunction, impotence. For women, stress can affect the menstrual cycle. I talked about that already, um, but because of how irregular it can become when you're stressed out, it becomes very stressful in this process. And then when you do have periods when you're stressed out, often people report that they're heavier, they're more painful, and so as you can see, stress messes us up. And so anxiety and stress are both emotional responses, um, but stress is typically caused by an external tr trigger. The trigger can be short term, um, like I said, such as like a work deadline or a fight with a loved one, or stress can be a very prolonged event in your life, such as being unable to work, facing discrimination because of your identity or chronic illness. Um, and moving on there. So. Anxiety, stress, all this stuff. Is there a way to manage this stuff? Yes, thankfully there is. And um, self-care is my number one thing here. Uh, this is where we start. Before you start looking for all the right pills and the right juices and the right oils and whatever, let's think about how you're caring for yourself. When I'm taken care of, of course, this is very personal to me. Maybe something resonates here with you. But when I'm taken care of, I'm well rested. I'm eating well. Eating well doesn't mean I'm eating all the junk that I love. It means that I'm eating stuff that's healthy, nutritious, satisfying to me and fulfilling me, fueling me for my everyday needs. I'm able to focus. I'm motivated and I'm optimistic. And big thing, I'm emotionally and mentally balanced. So this is how I feel when I feel that I'm taken care of. Shifting gears a little bit to talk about holistic wellness when we're talking about wellness overall. That includes good sleep movement and exercise that makes sense for you individually, food that meets your dietary needs. You know, you, you might hear a lot of information out there um, about like food science or you got to eat this stuff. It's like, no, you got to eat what's good for you. So um, that's very important in so many phases of our life. Um, but in, in a lot of contexts, you might be overloaded with the kinds of research out there um, everybody has an opinion. And so I think it's good to take all that stuff in with a grain of salt, talk to your doctor, talk to your whoever, talk to your care team, and then figure out what works best for you versus trying to incorporate like a plan that was published on Facebook. Maybe that does, that's not going to be the best for you. Um, holistic wellness also includes healthy coping skills, being able to navigate through anxiety and stress and other triggering events in your life. And to me, holistic wellness includes self-love, really loving yourself. Um, so how can I engage in self-care? You might think that you're already doing it. So this is a refresher, or maybe this is something that you've been challenged with. Maybe you're not sure how to care for yourself because you've lived your entire life caring for other people. Um, this is actually a very common report from a lot of women. I don't know how to take care of myself. I know how to take care of my parents. I know how to take care of my siblings, my friends, my husband, my spouse, my whoever. My, um, but how do I take care of myself? What does that even mean? So these are some basic things. Of course, I could talk about this for hours and hours too, but here are some basic tips um, in terms of engaging in self-care. These are foundational. These are the pillars of wellness is move your body exercise regularly in whatever ways you can um, because this is not only good for you know building stamina endurance strength balance but it's also going to help you combat stress stress and anxiety come because you know there's this perception of fear or danger that we have to get away from so now your body's all amped up and it's ready to do something, either fight a bear or run away from an enemy or something like that. But most of the time we're at home, we're sitting on the couch and we're not having an outlet to get rid of all this extra energy that our body's built up to protect us. So exercise is a great way to blow some of that energy off. Um, and it's also just a great way to center yourself, ground yourself. If you're not familiar with mindfulness, that's another thing to look into. Mindfulness is a tenet of Buddhism, and it comes with this idea that you are in tune with your present moment, that you're in tune with your body, that you are aware of what's going on. You are on top of like triggering things, you know, when you start feeling some kind of symptom. 
exercise gets you to think about your breathing, gets you to think about the connection between your mind and your body, which is proprioception, your, your, your muscles and how they feel when you stretch, when you flex, when you do anything. This is all stuff that's related to mindfulness and tuning into that is very, very important for overall holistic wellness. Um, big thing, I talked about it already, but eating balanced meals, you know? I love to eat junk, like junk is delicious, it's great. And for a moment, sometimes it makes me feel happy, but you always have to remember that food is not your friend, food is not your comfort, food is not the person or thing that's going to make your problems in life go away. It's a very temporary dopamine hit when you eat sugar and fat and all these things that taste amazing. What you really wanna be doing is looking for fruits, vegetables, whole grains, things that will fuel your body better than processed foods. Um, and then of course, prioritize sleep. It's so hard to sleep. That's like one of the biggest things that I can think of, like every client that I've had in 2020 and 2021, one of the symptoms that they report is they can't sleep or their sleep is disrupted. So if you can't fall asleep and if you can't stay asleep, of course, these are big issues, um, but there are things that you can do to try to help in the journey of falling asleep. So good sleep hygiene, you know, like if you are somebody that feels you have to have the TV on to fall asleep, you might wanna rethink that, you know, like TVs give off blue light, all kinds of things that make your body think it's still daytime. So you might feel like you're, you still gotta be active. And so TVs can actually make it difficult to fall asleep. Same thing with your phone. If you're somebody that sleeps with your phone right next to you, which I gotta admit I am, um, but I don't have this issue with falling asleep, right? But if you are, and you are someone that falls, needs to have your phone next to you, maybe that's something to reconsider. Maybe that's something to visit or explore or try to experiment different placements of where your phone should be so you're not constantly staying up super late scrolling and um, researching and all these things. Um, you're thinking about winding down. Uh, exercise is great, but if you're gonna work out the hour before you go to sleep, it actually energizes you. It gets your heart pumping and it gets you awake. So working out right before bed is pretty hard for a lot of people because it makes it so they can't fall asleep. So pillars, like I said, movement, diet, and sleep. If you're eating good, if you're feeling good, and you're sleeping good, my hope is that a lot of other things in your body will start falling into place and many things will be good. So thank you very much for your attention and time. <laughs> Oh, and you know, I learned some technique about that too. I like to exercise right before bed, so I probably should do that at a different time right now. <laughs> I do so, yeah. think like if you don't have a problem with falling asleep, then it's a very individualized thing. So a lot of my tips and stuff are very generalized, but it's about finding what works for you individually. So if that works for you, keep working out at night. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And we will come back to you in a little bit about questions. Um, and now we like to, you know, ask some questions or let the, uh, you know, Emily to present her findings. So Emily, maybe you can just uh, take the slides and then uh, start your presentation. Okay. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, I am Emily. I'm a fertility doula. So this is what I talk about all day, every day. Um, and it's, it's, it was really interesting to hear a lot of what Jesus presented because I have a lot of the same information in my slides, but a slightly different angle. So if there's a little repeat, it just means it's that important. Um, so the first thing I really wanna stress is, you know, this, this, top, this topic is near and dear to my heart as someone facing infertility day in, day out. Um, but also I think it's really hard as, you know, I work as a birth doula as well. So I see all these pregnant people every day. And so it does feel like they're everywhere, but it's also important to remember that if you're struggling with infertility, you're not alone. I mean, right now we have 157 people on this chat and according to the poll, most everyone was trying to get pregnant. And there's not, you know, a giant eye on our forehead saying like we are infertile. So it's a more invisible um, thing that we deal with. But I think part of dealing with infertility is also saying that we are out there and that we're not alone and that this, hap this impacts one in eight people. So roughly about 6.7 million women. And then also I found it interesting that um, 25 percent of couples both same-sex and heterosexual couples face infertility and when they're facing that it's they have two or more contributing factors 
or one or more contributing factors. So that means that it's not just always the woman who is facing, who's dealing with this. And just knowing that your partner is also struggling with it can, I think, take some of that burden and stress. Like it's not just me, it is somebody else involved in this process. Um, so just a really important aspect to remember, we are not alone, you are not alone. And you know, if you don't know one, one of those people facing infertility, you know me now and I am facing infertility. So I hope that you know, we can kind of bond over this aspect, but also empower each other to learn from each other. I mean, I know just in the research and learning that I've done to become a fertility doula, I've met so many other people who have varying degrees of infertility. And it, I think it's really important to know that we're not alone and that in itself can reduce stress. Um, okay, so as Jesus mentioned, what infertility and stress are so linked, so closely linked that it's kind of hard to tell which one came first. You know, we've all heard those well-meaning people tell us, my friends, my sister's best friend just went on vacation and she got pregnant in 10 seconds. Meaning that if we were just able to relax, our fertility struggles would be cured. And yes, it would be nice to be able to just go on vacation and have everything fixed, but, um, that's some relaxing is not always enough, but it can't hurt as well. Um, so while stress may not be the cause of infertility, it can certainly contribute to the problem. Although I do want to highlight and say multiple times, simply relaxing does not cure infertility. So regardless of what the cashier at the grocery store told you, that is not alone going to fix it. If you know you can take up permanent residence at the fanciest spa, but if you have blocked tubes or severe endometriosis or male factor infertility, all the relaxation in the world is not going to spontaneously increase your chances of pregnancy. But there was a study in, done in 2011, it's linked down here at the bottom of the slide, um, that shows a delay in pregnancy when stress is present. Stress and depression are really common side effects of infertility, but then also do impede your chances of getting pregnant. Um, it, you know, if you have infertility, or if, you have, if you're having a really stressful day, earlier on in your menstrual cycle, that can delay ovulation, which then is going to change up your whole cycle. But then also if you have a stressful event later in your ovul or later in your menstrual cycle, that's gonna delay the production of progesterone, which is key to sustaining a pregnancy. Um, you know, big things about stress and infertility is that it not only impacts your entire body, but it entire impacts the entire, the couple, if you're in a heterosexual relationship where trying to actively uh, get pregnant. So you begin to disconnect, your sex life can suffer. Um, and, and if you're in the midst of fertility treatments, you know that your schedule doesn't really matter. Once you're, you know, your mirror says your LH is rising, you, you know, your partner has to be ready to go. And there's a tremendous pressure that each month that sex has to result in a pregnancy or it's a failure. And just having that internal dialogue where your sex life then becomes a failure, that can be really defeating to both your relationship and then to your self-esteem. Uh, spiritual and religious beliefs can also be really tested. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people have told me, oh, maybe it's God's will that you're not pregnant. And that is one of the most hurtful things to say because that isn't, I mean, that that's not how I feel and I don't really want people to be telling me that and religious beliefs aren't as big of a deal for me, but for others, that could be a really heartbreaking thing, right? Yeah, and like Ali said, just drink some wine and enjoy sex, and it's like, well, no, that's that's not how it works. Um, I mean, maybe for some people, but definitely not if, not, definitely not for me. Um, so the stress of all of this has a huge impact on our bodies, and we had that great slide earlier that showed all the different systems that were um, impacted. So I think that was, that's a really good visual to look at. So managing stress can definitely be helpful. Um, we want to get back to this kind of spa life. So rather than, you know, rather than kind of living in this congested major highway life, um, our bodies are equipped to prevent conception from occurring during times of extreme stress. The body's response to stress is to release a cascade of stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol that signal our body that conditions are not ideal for conception. And just like if you have been pregnant before, right, if you're trying to go into labor, if you stay calm and relaxed, your body's going to be more likely to go into labor because those stress hormones 
prevent things from happening when we don't feel safe ourselves. And just if we don't feel safe, our body's saying like, this is not the right time for you to conceive. So take a step back. Um, so these stress hormones will inhibit the release of the body's main hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is responsible for releasing of the sex hormones. Subsequently, this may suppress ovulation in women, reduce sperm count in men, and lower libido in both men and women. So as you can see, maintaining homeostasis, homeostasis is integral to both when trying to conceive and during fertility treatments. We want to give our bodies the best possible chance of reducing stress and increasing the amount of time spent in this rest and digest or rest and reproduce stage of life. Um, so every thought that enters your mind creates a corresponding biochemical response in the body. So it's really using the power of your mind is going to help you kind of, even if you don't feel like you're relaxed, if you tell yourself enough that you're relaxed, you will feel more relaxed. So this is our response to these outside stressors and thoughts that surround them can lead us to very different paths, the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. Um, okay. So, and then the next thing, um, I'm gonna go take you guys through a little mindfulness exercise that I go through with all my clients. So if you could kind of close your eyes, take us, you know, kind of relax, settle into your body. I liked how Haizu kind of sat back in her chair. And so that's really what you wanna do. Get comfortable. The chat can wait a second. It'll be fine. Um, so an interesting way to understand this powerful mindfulness is to read what's called the lemon script. As you're, the, as you're listening to this, Try to limit any outside distractions. Just relax for a second. Okay. I would like you to imagine you are now standing in your kitchen or the kitchen of someone you know. Choose a kitchen that you are very familiar with that is associated with pleasurable memories. As you see various different kitchens, you're, you flash through your mind's eye, settle on the one that feels the most comfortable, the most at home to you. Now bring your gaze to the counter and notice there's a big, beautiful wooden cutting board sitting there. On top of the board sits a bright yellow lemon. You notice its color, a vibrant yellow, its size and shape. You reach and pick up the lemon, noticing how it feels to your touch. The skin is both smooth and slightly bumpy. You may see the end where it was attached to the tree still. Next to the cutting board, you see a large sharp knife. Holding the lemon steady, cut the lemon in half. As you do this, you'll you're feeling the knife slice through the knife. It falls open, re revealing beautiful jewel-like pulp and neat rows. You see the fresh white pulp and perhaps some seeds inside. Drop, drops of the juice have spilled into the cutting board. Now take one half of the lemon and cut it again, make it into quarter, sli quarter size slices. Put the knife down and bring the lemon quarter up to your nose. You're aware of the sharp, fresh citrus scent spilling your nose. Touch the lemon to your lips, noticing the sensations. Now open your mouth and bite into the lemon. Okay, so you can open your eyes now. How many of you, how many of you had your mouth start watering? Um, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I did just reading it and I knew what was coming. Um, I think it's really a good example of how the different senses in our body were really be able to engage just in this imagery and the picture of the lemon. So if we could do that to relax our minds and bodies and maybe like will ourselves to get pregnant, I'm not saying that it could happen, but it's not going to hurt. So how, how do we do all of that? Um, Hisu has so those great examples, so I won't even talk about sleep and the power of sleep, but sleep is their number one friend. I know, you know, this. I'm on the East Coast, so it's almost nine o'clock at my time. So I'm getting all hyped up. I'm sweating, of course, and it's going to be hard for me to fall asleep because my adrenaline is high right now. But really, taking the time each night to relax, put some blue light glasses on if you are, you know, working on your computer or watching your TV to cut that blue light out is always good as well. Um, so one of the first things I like to do to re to suggest to all my clients is do one mindful activity a day. Even if it's just rereading that lemon script to yourself, then that is fine. Um, 
you know, this is going to be something that you're more individual. So I wouldn't say like eating a meal by yourself, unless you live by yourself, that's the fine one. But like a simple thing of like taking a shower, when you're taking a shower, truly notice what it feels like to sit in the shower, the temperature of the water, the smell of the soap, the feeling of the water hitting your skin, the soap and bubbles falling from your hair, the sounds that are in the shower, is your, you know, is your shower creaky a little bit when you walk, when you move around? Is it really relaxing. Take note of all of those different senses just by being in the shower. And that alone is going to put you more present in the moment. And then hopefully kind of relax all those other sensations to get in that rest and hopefully reproduce stage. Um, I also really love a body scan after a stressful moment. And it could be simple as saying to yourself, relax your shoulders, relax your neck and relax your jaw. You know, I, I noticed that I really hold a lot of tension in my jaw. And that actually is really common for women as well. Um, your jaw and pelvic floor are linked. So when you do get pregnant, you're by relaxing your jaw during labor, it's actually going to open your pelvic floor too. So if you want to, if you notice the connection between that as you're sitting there, it's kind of interesting to note that as well. Another great way to do a body scan is just start at your toes and take a couple deep breaths and only think about your toes, then move up your body. You can find if you're holding stress in any of those particular areas, or if it's just a great time to kind of reflect on your how your day went. Um, I've noticed that sometimes when I do a body scan like that, that I will um, realize that I'm like sitting kind of awkwardly and kind of readjust my stance so that I'm more centered and more grounded in my position rather than kind of leaning over and everything. So I think it's a really great way just to kind of reassess. Um, definitely before this webinar, I, you know, scan my body, relax my jaw a little bit because it can be a stressful, stress isn't always a bad thing, but it isn't something that we always wanna hold in our bodies. Um, another great thing to do is repetition. Um, and this is to get your mind in a more relaxed state. This could be, simply repeating a mantra of your choosing, you know, as you're walking in to the fertility clinic, like, I am enough. I am worth this. I am worth the effort that I am putting into my body. Whatever it is that feels like it fits for you. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like, it could be colorful, could have some choice words in it. If you're on cycle day one, you know, maybe your, your mantra is going to look a little different than if you're on cycle day 29. But having something that you repeat over and over is going to allow you to hear it enough and it will become more of a fact rather than an opinion. Something I also really like to do with my clients is build balance statements where they focus, where we focus on a particular feeling of stress and turn it into a positive or neutral feeling rather than a negative stressful situation. Uh, and sleep sleep. Let's just all have a good night's sleep. That's really important. Um, breathing techniques are also really great. So a good deep exhale can actually drop your heart rate. And by dropping your heart rate, you're going to get more into that parasympathetic nervous system that we all want to be in where we're nice and relaxed. And food, like Jesus said, is super important to our bodies. And it's not necessarily like you're, yeah, you're, you don't need to check the box of like, okay, I had my omega threes. I had my salmon today. So I got that. I had my green vegetables. I got that. Maybe something doesn't feel right in your body and it might not necessarily be an allergy, but if you feel bloated, if you feel kind of gassy, if you just don't feel good, that's your body's way of telling you that something isn't working for you. Uh, so working with a practitioner who can run a food sensitivities test can also be really beneficial. So you're not necessarily looking at the allergy, but maybe you just have a sensitivity. And so you can decrease that. Also, a real easy way to do that, too, is going on an elimination diet. I'm not, I'm not a dietitian, so I can't recommend that. But like Whole30 or something, that can be a great way to kind of assess as you reintroduce foods what feels good to your body and what you've just kind of gotten used to. Um, an example for me is I recently cut out gluten from my diet because I've noticed that I just get a, he a small headache for about 10 minutes after I have gluten. So it's not a big deal, but it's obviously my body's way of saying like, that doesn't agree with you. It's not bad enough to say I'm an allergy and I need to completely avoid it, but it's definitely something that I should reduce doing. Uh, and lastly, daily movement. 
just, it doesn't have to be 90 minutes on your Peloton, but even a 20 minute walk or 10 minutes of yoga in your living room or while you're watching TV at night, you know, just doing a quick little stretch is going to be really beneficial to get the blood flowing and just kind of reconnect with your body that we're putting so much pressure on um, during fertility treatments. Okay. Um, so the, to wrap up, I just want to, you know, stress again, throughout this entire webinar, you're not alone. There's hundreds of people on here with us. We don't need to do this alone. And while you may not know anyone who's in directly dealing with infertility treatment, one of the sayings that I've heard is it's the worst club with the best members. Um, so gives a little bit of hope to the fact that there's a ton of people that are facing this and who are all really supportive of each and every person in it. And so my last two little tidbits are no is a complete sentence when it comes to life, fertility treatments, parenthood, everything. Um, and there are practitioners out there who believe you and support you. If you haven't found them yet, keep looking. We are out here. Um, if you're experiencing pain and no one's listening to you, pain is not a normal symptom. You are allowed to find a doctor that will hear you. And it may not be a doctor. It may be a health coach. It may be a fertility doula. It may be a talk therapist. It may be a dietitian. It's a much larger scope that there are people to help you. So we are here and you are not alone. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily, for your presentation. And I really love the exercise for the lemon. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, think about the lemon is always kind of relaxing for me. So yeah, so thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and the next, I just like to you know take a couple minutes to introduce Mira, and I have seen some questions in the chat about Mira, so I will answer them all together. Um, so if you are not a Mira user yet, so Mira is the uh, uh, fertility tracker that help you to track your fertility hormones. So the difference is that we track uh, so many hormones together. We now track LH estrogen. And the good news is that like our progesterone is launching next month, okay? So this is a huge news and I have seen questions in the chat. I just want to answer that live. Pre-order will start from the beginning of June, so which is literally just 10 days away from today. So if you're interested in the progesterone and you want to get early access, please sign up on our website. Okay, so you can just go to miracare.com, miracare.com, and there should be a pop-up, there should be a box at the bottom of the website, wherever you go, and enter your email. So you will receive the email when progesterone is pre-ordered. Okay, so pre-order also means that we are gonna ship that really soon, probably in a two to three months, and the product will ship. So I'm so excited about this because you know LH progesterone and the estrogen, that's like a complete uh, panel for your hormones during your regular menstrual cycle. So all of this measurement will be in a number. So there are quantitative measurements and then uh, it will detect your fertile window up to six days. That's that's the like complete fertile window. So it will tell you when you're fertile, when you're not fertile, complete days of all the fertile days, all the infertile days, when ovulation will happen and the progesterone, yes, will confirm you. I saw Jessica in the question, com progesterone will confirm yes you have ovulated right so if you have pcos you have hormone imbalances or you have certain any condition you just like to know more or you're trying to avoid the pregnancy you want to know ovulation actually has already occurred this is a hormone to use LH itself will not be able to tell you that information for sure. It can, it can only tell your body was trying to ovulate. If you're under normal condition, yes, you probably did. Um, if not, then, you know, there could be other conditions happen. So this is the, uh, you know, the hormone chart I just mentioned. So LH hormone, why do we need to measure so many hormones together? LH hormone is to detect your ovulation. This green dot here in the middle of the chart is your ovulation. And the estrogen hormone will increase about four to five days before ovulation. So that will give you your entire fertile window. And on the other side, will give you entire non-fertile window. And the purple line, which is the progesterone, and that will give you your ovulation has already occurred. So progesterone will increase after ovulation has done. So that will increase after LH and after estrogen 
hormone surge. So when you see your PDG increase or progesterone increases after ovulation is done or at the later phase of the cycle, you can be pretty much sure that ovulation has already occurred. And then at this time, I'm also answering the, another question I saw in the chat that, oh, is the progesterone wound, is a separate wound or is that gonna be combination with other two ones? So for now, the uh, it's a separate one because most likely you will be testing progesterone at a different time time you know different day right so you test the LH and estrogen first the while ovulation is happening and then you test the progesterone later after ovulation is done okay so you know, Mira has already helped so many women trying to get pregnant or at least identify what kind of issues do you have. And we have many users, they struggle with fertility, they struggle with, they have PCOS, they have condition or many of them like, I just have unexplained infertility. Personally, I hate that word. Uh, you know, there's no such a thing as unexplained. It's something must be wrong and or something, it's, it's not as serious or as clear cut as the diagnosable condition or disease, but there's definitely something wrong. So we have many people are going through this kind of gray zone, it's really painful, it's a lot of guesswork, but it's our goal to help them because we give the actual hormone number continuously, cycle after cycle, it will help you, at least help you to have a conversation with your doctor to see what is the problem is, um, instead of guessing, and if not, helping you to get pregnant. And we already have more than 10,000 customers got pregnant using Mira, and many of them are pretty magical. When I was reading the story, it was surprised were amazing to myself as well. Like, you know, we have people who have been trying for seven years and suddenly got pregnant with Mira. And I interviewed a customer that's on Instagram uh, that, you know, she was trying for her second child and was the uh, try for a year, and then she was on the edge of going to. IVF as recommended by the doctor. Again, unexplained infertility. And then she found Mira and she got pregnant during the first cycle. So no more painful or waste of money for the IVF procedure if we don't have to. Okay. And the last thing I want to say here is that um, I really encourage everyone to join our Mirror Fertility Club. So it's on Facebook, you see already, there are more than 4,000 members there already. Um, we understand, as Mirror, you know, we fully understand the TTC journey can be very stressful, but, you know, when we share, we, we understand that we're not alone. We can talk about the same language with people who are going through very similar things. We found that that's really pretty helpful. So Mirror Fertility Club is not just say something about, oh, how to use it device. It's more about, you know, I have this kind of hormone pattern and, you know, do you guys have that as well? Or how do you understand your hormone? You have hormone imbalances. What did you do? You know, how did you, what was experience like? How long did you try to get conceived? Maybe I'm already close to 40 years old. So this is my experience like. So a lot of encouraging story, positive energies, and a lot of very detailed cases you probably can relate to. So I really encourage you to take a look over there. Hopefully that's going to be a source to relieve some stress as well. Okay, very nice. So I'm now gonna go through some questions and also I will read some questions that uh, you know just came in while I was uh, presenting. So um, the I you know I got a question for you know those two ladies here. Uh, so one question is that the uh, someone was mentioning about they were going through the TTC journey and uh, had two miscarriages before. So actually Ali was mentioning about that. After two miscarriages and still TTC, a lot of family members here trying to help. And they were just trying to ask or comment or constantly praying for them coming along the way. So it's good intention, but it's actually creating more stress for the person or for the couple who is trying to get conceived. Uh, so what's your take on that? What's your suggestions? Maybe, uh, Hsu, you wanna try that first? From somebody else about boundaries. Um, really important throughout your life, not just during this period, to think about personal boundaries. These are emotional and sometimes even physical barriers that you put your between you and something that's stressing you out. Um, as 
was mentioned, it's like a lot of times it's your family and friends that are trying to be helpful, trying to start joyful conversation, trying to be encouraging in some kind of way, supportive. Um, and really, I think a lot of these folks, if they knew how you feel, um, they may be approaching you a little bit differently. I'm sorry if you hear this squeaking. It's my dog. She has a toy <laughs> next to me. I'm going to just grab that. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, what I would do is not what I'm saying, what you should do, because I don't know what your family dynamics are. I don't know what the relationships you have are like. So I don't want to give you advice. And then you go to your family or your friends and say something that's disruptive to the relationship. But for me, what's important is to be honest with how I'm feeling. You know, people that really mean well, I know that they care about me. And so I try to start sentences with I so that uh, it's really important about communication of where I'm coming from versus you, which automatically starts putting blame on stuff. You tend to ask me a lot of things and it makes me feel kind of uncomfortable is a lot more aggressive than I have been trying and it's really difficult. And I know that that's very, very hard to say for a lot of people, but that's something I want to propose as a challenge, you know, trying to conceive and having challenges with it is pretty common. It's not uncommon, but I think a lot of women go into this chapter of their lives thinking that they're the only ones going through this because people don't talk about it. I'm not really sure why this became a taboo topic in the first place. Um, but, you know, miscarriage is not as uncommon as I thought. And even having challenges during birth is not as uncommon as I thought. So maybe it's about changing the systems, right? If it's like being honest about it and talking about it, maybe you can model for folks that are not really aware that they can talk about it. Um, so boundaries, if you want to look into or do some research on how to maintain and establish these things, it can be really um, helpful for you for the rest of your life to protect your time um, to protect your sense of space um, and really to show others that you respect yourself and that you respect your own process. Um, so I know I didn't give the definitive magical answer and that's simply because I don't think it exists. I think um, how you respond to folks is going to be dependent on your relationship with them. But also remind yourself, these people care about you. And I think they would also care to know how you're really feeling and what you're going through. So whether you want to open up, that would be great. Um, and whether how safe it is to talk about that in that relationship. Um, I think it's important to be honest. And that's that's my take on it. Thank you so much, Husu. So, Amelie, I have a different question for you. Mm -hmm. So, Karina was asking about any tips regarding unexplained infertility. I have been hearing this word for so long. And, uh, you know, I just said I personally don't like it, but it's really stressful. It's a guessing situation and you don't know how long that's going to last. So anything you want to share? Yeah. So I was initially diagnosed with unexplained infertility <laughs> by my first doctor. And I also that's not a, that's not a diagnosis. Um, that's just kind of a Band-Aid. And I felt like I was being really pushed into IVF and that's not in our financial future. So I found a doctor who listened to me. I found a doctor who would hear me and would look at what was happening in my body. Um, I also began to track my menstrual cycle and really look at, you know, in, with using my mirror, but also by uh, doing a visual check of cervical mucus each month. Like how much was there? Was there enough? What about post peak? Was there, what was happening post peak? Was my luteal phase long enough that, um, was made it something that could sustain a pregnancy if it was going to happen. Um, and I began to see some patterns that weren't conducive to pregnancy. Um, so I found a doctor and Allie asked me who this doctor was. It, she is a uh, NAPRO technology doctor and she's based in Cary. And she is she's currently left, but her practice is still there. But their whole idea is that you look at the body first and figure out what's going on. And I saw another question as a fertility doula. That's one of the main mm -hmm. things that I do. I help you look at your body to see what is happening and how we can improve it. So if your period is eight days long and extremely painful with tons of cramps and heavy bleeding each day, that is not how your period should be. You shouldn't have cramps when you're on your period. And so working with kind of, is it, you know, better sleep? Is it better self-care techniques? Is it going on the right vitamins? Is it cutting out certain foods? All of this kind of plays into this factor of 
figuring out what is unexplained about your infertility. And is it unexplained because people aren't looking close enough or is there something that no one's asking the right question? And as, pe as patients, we have to be our best advocates, unfortunately. Um, you know, doctors mean well, they definitely mean well, but um, we are our best advocates throughout our entire lives. We are the ones who know our bodies the best. Thank you, Emily. So, Hisu, so another question for you. So, Joy was asking about um, how do we deal with all the pregnancy announcements, especially from a close family? It's very easy to fall apart each time. Of this community feature here. And the tip that resonated with me is social media hiatus. I actually don't have any social media at all for a variety of different reasons. Um, and it, it stems from this, right? It's like seeing stuff that actually doesn't make me feel very good. I talked about dopamine a little while ago because this is um, also a neurotransmitter that's released to help us feel some kind of pleasure, but it's very temporary. And what people get from browsing social media, scrolling and scrolling and looking at profiles and tapping on this and looking at that and getting likes and all this stuff mm -hmm. is dopamine release. It's like taking drugs. It feels really good, but it feels really good for a moment. And you're also exposing yourself to a lot of stimulus that's very stressful. And in this case, painful. Um, because then you start going into the world of comparison, right? It's like this stuff is happening to somebody else, but it's not happening to me. And then it starts impacting the way that you view yourself. There's a lot of shame and there's a lot of guilt associated with not being able to conceive when so many else, so many other people around you are. Um, so I think it's really, again, it comes back to boundaries and sometimes your boundary might be, I can only look at Instagram for five minutes a day before I start feeling like garbage you know if you notice that the things that you're consuming consuming as in tv shows any kind of media digital content once it starts making you feel not so great is it serving you is it really like something that you need to be doing in your life um, so i would really think about the pros and cons to being on social media or any kind of setting and see what is the healthiest option for you Thank you, Hisu. Thank you so much for that. So I like to take two more questions for Mira. I've seen that you know multiple people were asking about that. One question is about HCG test blood. So we mentioned about LH estrogen. That's what you can buy today. Progesterone. Don't forget to pre-order by June first. Okay, sign up on the website. You will get pre-order. You will get early access. You will get discount. And then the the other one is HCG. So that one gonna be launching in the in a few months, like maybe around a half a year or so on. And the, again, if you sign up for our email, you will get the access for that. Um, so for that one, it's not only confirming ovulation, it's also it's not only confirming pregnancy, it's also tracking the pregnancy progress. With many of us have experienced the miscarriage. We know how painful that is. And the most miscarriage happened during the first trimester. If our progesterone or HCG don't go up, don't go up as double every 40 hours, 48 hours as expected, there's a sign for miscarriage. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to relieve for you. So that's another news you guys might be interesting. And then another question about Mira in the chat is very popular is about FSA. So yes, Mira is FSA approved and you can purchase Mira with your card. And there is actually an article about FSA, how to purchase with your FSA card for, by Mira. So you don't need doctor referral and you don't need anything else. You just need your FSA card. You can purchase directly on Mira's, Mira's website. If you want to know how to purchase that, you can just Google Mira Fertility FSA. And the first article, it should be the Mira blog article. And that will have instruction about how to do that. So you don't have to you know, spend your own money if you have already saved uh, money in your FSA account. And this is something for the US only. Okay, so I have seen many other questions in the chat, but we are, you know, we don't have time to answer all of them. So I will do this. So I will let, you know, Hazu and uh, Amelie just uh, mention something about yourself. Like if people have more questions, they want to find you, they want to get a consultation from you, where can they find you? Maybe we start from Amelie this time. Okay. Yeah. So like I mentioned, my business is Carolina Birth and Wellness. You can find us at carolinabirthandwellness.com. I'll spell it out. Um, 
There are some mentions of pregnancy on there because it is a full service doula agency. So if it's a little bit challenging and I totally get that, you can also follow me on Instagram at fertile at fertile underscore mind and body. And that is specific to fertility and trying to conceive. Um, my email, if you want to contact me that way, is emily at carolinabirthandwellness.com. I'm also going to be launching a fertility self-care box shortly, which is going to talk about, it's going to have little tidbits of things that you can do at home, you know, like a sleep mask to promote sleeping in the dark, which is so good for balancing hormones, restoring hormones, um, herbs, if you want to start vaginal steaming at home, Epsom salts, and some other nice little tidbits. There's also a book from Mira about their uh, trying to conceive book that they published a few months ago, their ebook. So all sorts of great stuff is going to be in there. And the goal of it is to really, like Jesus said, take that self-care and do what feels good to you because that in turn is going to help your, um, your fertility and overall health. Sounds good. Thank you. And Jesus, you want to mention where to find you? I said I don't use social media, so you can't find me <laughs> anywhere there, even if you search really hard. Um, I guess unless it's not me, but uh, you can find, I don't have my own business, but I do work for one, which is called BetterHelp. Um, if you are interested in counseling for yourself, um, which it's always a good idea to talk to somebody when you're stressed out about anything, you can check out betterhelp.com slash Mira. And folks here using that link can get 10% off. I believe it's your first month, but if you go to betterhelp.com slash Mira, you'll see the actual details of what that discount looks like. If you have any questions about BetterHelp or me, you can feel free to email us at contact at betterhelp.com. If you stick my name somewhere in the email, it will make its way to me. Um, so feel free to reach out there if you have any questions about the service, about mental health counseling online and what that looks like, um, you can check us out. And then, of course, you can find BetterHelp on every social media platform, um, username BetterHelp. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. And then now is an exciting time. I, I know, you know, I saw the chat over there. You guys want to have the refill of both the ones. You want to have discount. And here's the opportunity. If you want to stop up, stock up your test ones, or you are interested in Mira, you want to make a purchase, give it a try today. So here is the 15% off for everything on our website. So the website is miracare.com, miracare.com. And then you can get both the, the kit, which is what you need as a starting point, or the uh, test ones. And this test was tested LH and estrogen at the same time on the same test one with a code today. That's Mira TTC webinar. Okay, so this is exclusive. This is only going to be showing up here. And we're not usually running the promotion for test ones. It's very rare. So make sure you utilize that opportunity. So the last thing I want to do is like, I want to make sure I know how we did. So please do our favor. Uh, just the, uh, you know, uh, just answer the questions on the screen again. I'm putting up two more questions over there. I just want to know, you know, how we did. Was that helpful to you? What kind of content you like to hear in the future? And again, we really apologize for the technical issue at the beginning of the webinar. This has never happened to me. I don't know what's wrong with the platform today, but we will troubleshoot about that. Okay, so I'll give uh, 10 more seconds for the, uh, the, the answers to come in. Great, thank you so much, guys. And uh, I got 98% people today that they want to watch another webinar from Mira. And we, did different, uh, we definitely will hear you and we heard you in the past. We'll continue to do that with all the free resource. And we wish everyone the best and have a relaxing evening. And thank you too, ladies, for your great inputs. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.